Hunger Games. Hello friends and welcome to Beer in a Movie, a series where, as the title implies, I drink a beer while I watch a beer. Piss off, Cap. This time I refrigerated my beer and I also cut a lime. Get in there, lime. Oh, yeah, squirt everywhere. Oh, oh, oh there you go. Oh, fizz, baby, fizz. In the previous and very first edition of Beer in a Movie, I spoke about Fallen. A series that wanted to emulate Twilight's success so badly that it just stole key story elements and pretended it was something new because, hey look, these are angels, not vampires. So it's super different. <laughs> and because last time I talked about Twilight's failed successor, I think it's only fitting to talk about Twilight's actual successor in pop culture. And that is The Hunger Games. <laughs> Where Fallen had just tried to swap out the creatures, angels instead of vampires, Hunger Games did away with them altogether. Although, while Finnick might not be a supernatural creature, he does seem too good to be true. Am I right, all ladies out there who fantasized about this man? I know what you're talking about. Or at least I can pretend to and pander to you by showing you shirtless pictures of him. Hmm, how about this one? Yeah. Oh, what's this? That's a picture of me? How did that get in there? I'm not trying to condition your brain by showing you pictures of handsome men and then also sliding in pictures of me so your brain associates me with the handsome men. No, I'm not doing that at all. So how did the Hunger Games become so popular? If you have a product, especially in a creative field, you're gonna wanna craft an elevator pitch. Something concise, just a few words that you can pitch quickly, say if you're in an elevator with somebody, that's gonna elicit interest in your products. Here's how the elevator pitch for the Hunger Games would go. Oh, my week as a literary agent has been so stressful. I've seen probably over a thousand queries. I couldn't possibly listen to another one. I'm just glad I get to enjoy my weekend in this nice open park. Excuse me, you're a literary agent, aren't you? I have the best book idea. No, please, please, no. It's the weekend, save it for Monday. Totally, totally understand. Thank you. I'll save it for Monday. Kids killing kids. What? That, just my book idea. Arena, 24 kids, only one comes out alive. Fire, swords, knives, death. So much death. Final two contestants, in love with each other. But it can wait till Monday. I will literally blow you if you tell me more. The first film did well critically, and it's not hard to understand why. The performances were outstanding. I would bet, though, that you could not tell me how it opens. Can you? It's an interview with the head games maker, uh, Fancy McFacial Air, and he's giving a little backstory on the games. And then Stanley Tucci, who is phenomenal in his small but memorable role, Roll? <laughs> How much have I had? <laughs> I'll have some more. He's the one that's interviewing Fancy, and he asks, what is your personal style? What, what defines your personal signature? To which Fancy thinks about it, takes a breath, and just as he's about to answer, no! No! So good. That is a subtle way of answering the question without answering the question. And it's like a more terrifying way to answer it, too. Beautiful. We all know what happens from here. Katniss's sister is picked. Katniss volunteers in her place. The volunteer! And then she's whisked off to the capital to start her training for the games. What I do not understand is this pin. Katniss literally gets this pin for free. I want you to look at this woman. Does, <clears throat> Does this woman look like the kind of person who's gonna give away stuff for free? She lives in the poorest district. Why would she be giving out freebies? You keep it. It's yours. So it's almost as if this woman is trying to get rid of this pin. Hmm, interesting. A theory is forming, but let's see what happens next. Katniss gives that pin to Primrose to protect her so that her name is not drawn. And as long as you have it, nothing bad will happen to you. What happens? Out of the thousands of envelopes that are in the bowl, Primrose's is picked. Good job, Pin. The pin is cursed. Do I need to prove it even more? I will. Prim then gives the pin back to Katniss, which, re-gifting Prim? What a classless move. Show some class, you ungrateful bitch. <laughs> classless, man. Katniss then manages to get that pin into the games, where she watches her favorite person die. She wins, but then has to go back for another Hunger Games, inadvertently starts a war that she does not want, has thousands of people die, and has to watch her sister get blown up right in front of her. All because of that pin. 
I may be a little drunk already, but I think it's the pin, guys. I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to talk about Katniss going to the Capitol because, oh, that just hits a special spot in my heart. I love rankings. I love when characters are ranked, especially when there's combat rankings. Oh. Oh, I love when skills are ranked, abilities are ranked, people in general, rank them, just fucking rank them, man. It makes it so easy for me, the viewer, to figure out in a fictional matchup who would beat who. I read the book years ago, and I remember some advice that Hamish gave Katniss when they were doing the, the communal training with all 24 contestants. Hamish told Katniss not to touch the bow and arrow because her skills are already great. Better not to tip off all the other contestants that she has that skill so that they like keep the bow and arrow from her. Very smart advice. However, Cadmus, when she goes in to get her private ranking, she picks up the bow and arrow and she fires two shots. The first shot misses. Her second shot, she skewers an apple. That makes her one of two, 50%. She made 50% of her shots. Okay, so I kind of forgot that Katniss fired a third shot, which she nailed. So technically she was two of three, but none of the rankers saw that second shot. So in their eyes, she was one of two. And then she leaves early. She had more time to show other skills, but she chose not to. For some reason, the rankers then decided a girl hitting 50% of her shots deserved the highest individual score out of everybody in their skills. She showed one skill, which she was only half good at, and they gave her one point away from a perfect score. How does that make any sense? PETA only manages to get an eight, but he has a really funny moment in training. So he's trying to climb this net, he falls off it, people start laughing at him. So Cadmus approaches him and she's like, hey, you need to go over there pick up that heavy shit, and then throw that heavy shit all over to someplace else. And Peter's like, how is that gonna help at all? And Katniss is like, just do it. So Peter walks over, picks up this heavy ball, and then heaves it at like a weapons rack. And then the other kids are like, oh shit, we better not fuck with this guy. That's a really good ability to have in a survival game. Cause think about it. What if we get put into an arena without any sharp weapons at all? All that we have are small boulders to kill each other with. That guy is gonna be someone we don't wanna fuck with. We better not get on his bad side. He's just gonna be flinging boulders everywhere. We're fucked. One decision the film made was to split up the film into two parts, basically. And that's kind of how the book worked as well. But it's a really distinct shift from the first half to the second half. First half is the selection, the training, the stakes, the talking. Second half is all the action. And it's brilliant because the first half, when it starts to feel like it's dragging just a little bit, the shift is made and then it's just overdrive mode the entire time. Kudos to the movie for actually showing some death and blood as well. And you have to show that stuff because the story is about a bunch of kids killing other kids. You gotta show some of it. You can't take the Disney route and be like, oh, everyone just fell off a cliff. They just fell into the mist and we just assumed they died. Actually, before we get too far, I wanted to talk about this really cool Hunger Games merch I bought from the street vendor in Florida. Do you see these? These are the official earpieces that the games makers used inside of the games maker facilities. It's so cool. The guy only charged me $600. He said they're worth like three times that. He gave me a deal because we were such good friends. I mean, we only knew each other for a few minutes, but uh, I feel like we really made a connection. I hope his sick bomb gets better. Hey, wait a second, these are Raycons. Oh my god, I know what's going on. I can't believe I was so dumb. Raycons were the official earpieces of the Hunger Games? How did I never know this? For legal reasons, I should say that Raycons are not the official sponsors of the Hunger Games. However, they are the sponsor of my video, which arguably is better. The special effects in my video far outclasses anything that the Hunger Games has ever done. The Raycons that I have are the Everyday E25s, the battery lasts for up to six hours, they're super comfortable, and most importantly to me, because I always seem to have problems with this, but the Bluetooth connection is very, very solid. And the best news yet, you don't have to buy these from some shady street vendor with a fake sick mom in Florida for $600. They're very affordable, about half the price of other premium earbuds, and as an extra 
extra little bonus. If you go to buyraycon.com slash Dylan is in trouble, you'll get an extra 15% off that price. They come in an assortment of colors, so have your pick. To be honest, I have the black ones, but the red ones are looking really appealing to me. If you do pick up a pair, don't forget to use my link. I'll leave it in the description. Again, buyraycon.com slash Dylan is in trouble. It's a very easy way to save some money, so make sure you use that link. And once again, thank you to Raycon for sponsoring. Cadmus early on in the game is the target of the strongest alliance. It is the four people from the first two districts, known as the Careers, because they train for the Hunger Games in preparation, and then they volunteer their strongest people so that they win most years. And the fifth member of that alliance is PETA. Gasp? He betrayed Katniss after saying he was in love with her? Gasp some more? Two things happen here that I do not understand. Number one, the only reason the team of four allow PETA into their group is so that he can help track Katniss down. And it makes sense, it's a good strategy. Only Peta really knows Katniss, so he would be best to track her down. What I do not understand is after she is tracked down and she's cornered up in a tree with nowhere to go, they don't just kill Peta. Why wouldn't they just kill him then and there? He is of no use. Is it just in case they have to like cross a river later on in the story and they have no way to do it? but they need Peter to throw small boulders into the river so that they can walk across the small boulders? Number two, Peta is undercover. He's not really with the careers. So why doesn't he just kill them in their sleep? Right before Katniss drops the bees on them, they show the careers on the ground and everyone's asleep, including Peta. Why wouldn't Peta stay awake and then murder them each in their sleep, or at least try to, because he tries to save Katniss later in a one-on-one -on -one with Kato, and Kato just fucking jerks him through the leg with a sword. What else happens? Oh, Rue comes in, and then Spear comes in Rue. <laughs> oh, come on. That was a little funny. Don't tell me you didn't laugh. One thing that I think the book could have done better was set up rivalries. And they started to do that a little bit in the communal training. Kato, who is like kind of the big bad of all the contestants, he gets into a little spat with another kid in the training period. I would have loved to see more interpersonal relationships and rivalries play out between all the contestants. And to that point, Thresh and Kato are the same. Kato is from a rich district and he's merciless. Whereas Thresh is from a poor district and he's merciful. However, they're both like physically and mentally strong and people fear them. And it, it would have been interesting to see them clash. If I remember correctly, in the books, they say that Thresh just goes off on his own and just claims like a whole territory, like a big ass part of the, the arena. He just claims it and no one challenges him because he's so scary. They really set him up to be like really frightening, but then he also saves Cadmus at one point. It would have been so perfect to like flesh him out a little bit more, but the death they gave him was death by dogs off screen. <laughs> And I understand in the books, because the books are singularly focused from Katniss's perspective. It's first person present tense, meaning that Katniss is telling the story as it's happening for her. So she doesn't see Kato doing all the stuff that Kato's doing, but the movie's not like that. The movie shows a bunch of stuff that Katniss isn't privy to, including like inside the games room, scenes of President Snow, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But since the movie's kind of like getting away from just seeing stuff that Katniss sees, why not flesh out Thresh a little bit more? Flesh Thresh. <laughs> That's dumb. I just think that it was a missed opportunity because Thresh and Kato are foils of each other while also sharing a number of similarities. It would have been a perfect duel. But instead they just kill him off screen by dogs. That's so boring. It's down to the final three. We got Katniss, Peeta, and Kato. Those are the last three people alive after Thresh is eaten off-screen by dogs. Did I mention how stupid that was? Anyways, Katniss and Peeta are just running for their lives from the dogs, and they decide to head to the cornucopia to get some height, to get some verticality. What's the word I'm looking for? To get to safe ground, because the dogs can't climb a cornucopia. One thing you might not know is Kato is already here. He's already on top of the cornucopia. He could easily, just by the element of surprise, go and push them both over. They're just standing at the edge with the dogs at their feet, he could have just pushed them both over, dogs eat them, he wins. But instead, he grabs Katniss and just throws her back to safety. To some safe ground of the cornucopia. And then he continues to like physically dominate them. And he just keeps throwing them to safety. He's like throwing them around like they're ragdolls. But he never throws them over to the side. 
to where the dogs are waiting to eat them. He keeps throwing them to safety, and it pisses me off. It's a one-sided fight, and PETA's not much help. And maybe if there were small boulders around, if there were, he'd probably fucking destroy Kato. But there aren't, so he can't. <laughs> Instead, Katniss shoots Kato, PETA pushes him over, he gets eaten by the dogs, <laughs> and then the games are over. They both win. Suzanne had a few options when thinking about where to take the story after the first one. On her first day of brainstorming the idea for the sequel, she sat down and she said, well, I burned through my golden nugget idea of throwing a bunch of kids into an arena and having them fight to the death. Can't do that again. Or can I? <laughs> and it works! To her credit, she makes it work. The second story has a different arena, which is a lot cooler in my opinion. The contestants are so much better. They're all former winners, that's a cool idea. And also, there's this bubbling undercurrent of a coup, and Katniss is completely unaware of it, despite being the center of it. Even though Suzanne Collins is just rehashing the same compelling element from the first one, she manages to add a bunch of new stuff and make it work, and I love her. Whoa. Uh, I need to get a few more beers deep before I start telling people I love them. <laughs> that was quick. They did change directors. Gary Ross directed the first one. I gotta say, Francis Lawrence did a much better job. Not to say that the first film was bad. It just had some questionable decisions. A lot of sh really shaky handhelds. I like handhelds, but not when it's this shaky. And the second one is easily the best movie out of all the movies. And look at these two shots. These two shots are better than anything ever. <laughs> the last two movies, Mockingjay Part 1 and 2, are... Uh, how should I put this? Okay, imagine you have a bag, right? And it's empty. And then you find a bunch of suck, and then you put it into that bag, and you just fill it. You have a bag of suck in the end. That's the last two movies. I should probably talk about Gale. No! No, don't do it. But first I want to talk about the third film. I know the majority of it takes place in a bunker, but does it need to be so goddamn colorless the whole time? If that film was in black and white, I probably wouldn't have known the difference. Gale, however, looks great in grays. He's the only one in the entire world of the Hunger Games. He's the only one that looks good in grays. And it makes me realize that the only people that are team Gale are people that just physically find him attractive because he's six foot three and he's really handsome. There's no reason to be Team Gale otherwise. There's actually a moment in the third movie when Gale is really sad and Katniss goes to console him and she touches him and she discovers that he's cardboard. He's, he's literally cardboard. He has no death. <laughs> While Mockingjay Part 1 was just boring because it consisted of Katniss being sad and traumatized and then shooting commercials, <laughs> promos for a revolution. Part two was even worse. Why? We spend the majority of the movie with Cadmus making her way through a booby-trapped city in order to get to President Snow's mansion. She loses friends along the way. Finnick, who goes down in a blaze of glory, saving Cadmus's life and everyone else in his group's life after recently getting married. If anyone talks shit about Finnick, I'm Finna, stick my foot in your butt. That was actually pretty good, Dylan. <laughs> she literally travels across this mind-filled city in order to reach her end goal. That's what the whole movie's about. That's what we journey for. So that we can get the payoff of Katniss reaching her goal. What happens at the end? So they're making their way to the gates and then all of a sudden the rebels attack. A car flips over, Gale is captured, Katniss has to go on alone. She's right at the gates. Then, bombs drop. Katniss is blown backwards. She watches her sister get blown to bits. Then when she wakes up from the bombs, the war's over. President Snow is detained, captured. It's over. What? So the movie's telling me that if Katniss didn't do a single thing, if she just sat back, kicked her feet up, and did nothing in the last movie, the outcome would have been the same. What's the point of following her then? What's the point of having her go on this journey and this mission? People don't watch a YA story to watch a character accomplish nothing. What the- what was the point? And don't get me started on PETA in the last two movies. A brainwashing plot? Really? And the way that they dance around it. They're like, yeah, Tracker Jacker Venom mixed with some mind level psychology. It goes to the fear stems of your brain. They really just made it a farce. They're just like, yeah, uh, we got nothing to do with PETA. What if 
they, they alter his memories and he tries to, to kill Katniss. That would be a good story, huh? No! It would not be! There is a great moment, though. When the bombs go off, Katniss is blown backwards and her, her shirt starts on fire. And it's like the fire's almost mocking her for having the moniker, the girl on fire. It's such a grandiose moniker for someone who accomplished so little. All she did really is win one Hunger Games. She was the symbol of a revolution, but she didn't want that title, nor was she really good in that position. We dare to end this hunger for justice! You just been in battle! I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, speaking of those bombs, by the way, everyone's like, oh yeah, obviously, the bombs came from the Capitol. The Capitol used those bombs on their own women and children. Makes sense, right? Why wouldn't they bomb their own people? It's just widely accepted that the capital bombed their own people. And no one stops to think, hmm, that doesn't seem logical. It seems like something District 13 would do, bomb the enemy's people. No one thinks that. And it literally takes President Snow saying, it was District 13. It was your allies that did that, not me. The idea that I was bombing our own helpless children, it turned the last of my guards against me. I don't believe you. You are so dumb! You are really dumb! Look, I don't know how you guys feel about the Hunger Games books. I thought the third one was not good. There, it had no chance to be good. Because the first two are focused solely on Katniss training for games in the games. That's the first two. The third one is, hey, we're gonna build a whole revolution from scratch. We're gonna overthrow the national government and then create a new society. You, you dedicate one third of your total story to a giant, giant, giant plot, but the first two are just Katniss in the games. Remember what I talked about before? The first person present tense? That means in the books, we can only see, hear, and experience things that Katniss is personally experiencing right now in the moment. That means in the books, we hardly ever interact or see President Snow doing anything, but he's the big bad of the series that needs to be toppled yet we hardly ever see him or interact with him or feel any kind of emotion towards him because he's almost not present in the story. The only real moment that I felt like President Snow was fleshed out was in the third book when Finnick is talking about how President Snow had poisoned all of his rivals and he has sores in his mouth because he's also ingested a lot of that poison, but he had antidotes for it, but it can only do so much. That's fascinating stuff. That's like the most I know about President Snow. And Suzanne Collins recently came out with a prequel that tells President Snow's story. However, if you have to write a whole book just to flesh out your main villain, you didn't create a very compelling villain. That is stuff that you need to do in the main story. And that, my friends, is the story of The Hunger Games and the reason for its popularity. I think I covered that information in this video. I probably did. I hope you like this beer in a movie series because there's more coming. Is this a porn website? Because there's more coming. <laughs> I, I should be embarrassed that I'm drunk after one beer, <laughs> but I'm not. Thank you guys for watching. Love you. See you next time.